Test, 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 test. There we go. Yes? Yeah. Starting? Yeah. Yeah, Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, such rebel. <laughs> it's not even really funny, but it, I'm sorry. It is. Anyways, I'm just not even going to. I'm not going to it too much. Hey, so obviously, as you can see, we actually didn't originally plan this. Um, we were still planning on having our uh, sunset service without the sunset, but we felt like, hey, it would have still been wonderful. Everything was still good. However, we had a crazy strong gust of wind. And it totally, as the worship team was already set up in place, everything was in order, totally blew the canopy, like right over them. And so praise the Lord that no one got hurt, but it started just, it was just wild. And so we ended up having to just scratch that plan A. And so because I believe God is sovereign, our heart is right, we've never been trying to, we're not doing this in arrogance. We're not trying to be, you know what I mean, uh, zealous without knowledge and understanding. We're just going to trust then that the Lord had other plans. Amen. He's sovereign. He's all-knowing, all-powerful, and he understands all things and sees the bigger picture. So I'm just going to go ahead and trust by faith then that he had a different plan for us to come in here for whatever reason. Amen. So with that being said, I'm glad you guys still came out. I'm glad even though you saw, uh, saw that we weren't out there, you still decided to come in here. It looks like it's about 25% of the capacity. And so praise the Lord. So for everyone that is watching behind the scenes, it is only 25% of the capacity. We are good. Amen. All right. So praise the Lord. I guess he worked it out just right. Okay. Hey, I wanted to share a few things. So now we're in here, obviously, we had to improvise, adapt, and overcome, and so thank you for being gracious. We, they had the full setup out there, and then we just had to eliminate everything, but praise the Lord, amen? Sometimes we just need to be reminded that in the simplicity, the Lord is just sweet and He's faithful, so it was still a wonderful time of worship. I think someone said we only have one speaker working at the moment because we were focusing on out there. Um, hopefully it's not a distraction. If you didn't notice, then scratch what I just said, amen? Just pretend that they all work and everything is good. Okay, I want to share two things real quickly before we get into the Word of God today. One, I do want to say for everyone that came out on Friday night for Before the Throne, amen? That was a blessing. We took time out of our, our just to come and bring our worship to the Lord, and it was very interesting. Seemed like a lot of odds against us uh, at that last moment, but it was just sweet, amen? And so I'm glad that for those who were able to come out here, you purpose in your heart to come out and take part in the worship. It was wonderful, but I also want to give just really a special thanks to our worship team, as I just, I know, like, leading up to it, there was a lot of warfare and preparation, and when we put a date on our heart, and we said we were going to do it uh, Friday, they just got together, and everyone was just faithful, and practiced, and just really, you know, sought the Lord and prayed, so they came out there, and I really believe they just brought it all, amen, like, just their heart was such in the right place, and it was sweet, and so we were blessed by it, so I just want to also say thank you to our worship team, who uh, took part in that, yeah, amen. Amen. It really was sacrificial love, I believe, and, and, and service, and so praise the Lord for them. It was a wonderful blessing. So if you came out today, I hope you were blessed indeed, and as we desire to bless the Lord with our worship. Okay, here's the second thing. I wanted to share that. Okay, so you know already, as a fellowship, our hearts desire as much as we can, as the Lord provides, and, and we are able to. We want to be a blessing to the community as well. Um, and so one of the things we've been trying to do is either the diaper drives and also the food drive. And so with that being said, this coming Saturday, we have another opportunity. Donations came in and we are blessed by it. And so we have the opportunity to be able to um, be a blessing to the community as much as we possibly can. And so this coming Saturday, uh, the 17th, we are actually going to have another food drive to the public, to the families that's out here. And um, so we're going to blast that, I believe, in all the different platforms. And so we're going to get the public the information they need to get. We have PR people and, and our brother Phil and some others that are going to go out and do that. So I'm not too, too worried about expressing um, certain information for the public. I want to actually um, address the church family. So this is something that's going to be concerning the church. So I want to give you two things concerning the church uh, with the food drive that's coming up. Um, I was thinking of Galatians, so as we were looking at the food that we have to distribute, I think we have about, I want to say a little over, around 2,000 uh, plates to be able to hand out, something like that, and so we're going to try to divide it the best we can, but as we were thinking about it, dividing and seeing how we're going to do this, the Lord pressed it upon our heart, that as much as we also want to be a blessing for sure to the public, we also know that within the church families, there are needs as well, and some of us could be touched as well by some of the things uh, going on, and the, the secondary issues, if you will, because of the lockdowns. Uh, with uh, jobs and, and finances and stuff like that. So with that being said, we look at the scriptures and I think of Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10 that says, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all, but then it says, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Amen? 
So I guess I'm sharing that to say our heart's desire, as much as we all, we definitely want to, and we're still going to be a blessing to the public out there, to the community in the island of Guam. We most definitely want to also be a blessing to one another in the household of faith, to be able to help and meet needs and just love on each other the best we can, love in action, and the way the Lord showed us to do so. So with that being said, if you are here in the church family and you are one of those who you have those needs and you're in need of food for your family and, and there's a way that this can be a blessing for you, amen? then we want to be able to offer that and be able to really minister and reach out to you first before we actually open it up to the public. We're still going to open it to the public, but we're going to be wanting to be a, minister, uh, a blessing to the church family first. So this is the game plan. So on Saturday, 11 o'clock, don't get the numbers, the, the time frame mixed up, okay? 11 o'clock is going to be for the public, and they're going to come, and they're going to be lined up and getting ready for food, and we're going to um, put out on social media how they can come and do that. But before that, from 10.30 to 11 o'clock, so from 10.30 to 11 o'clock, this coming Saturday the 17th, for the church family first, if you have needs and you need food for you and your family, so we're going to ask you guys to please come out first. And so I'm not sure how we're going to do it for the public, and I'm not even going to address that, but for the church, I've been talking to those who are going to be uh, spearheading it. So from what we understand, it's going to be, so I just want to clarify this, we're all here anyways, if we're going to line up like the way we kind of always do for the food drive. So this is for the church specifically. For when, uh, so in the back side here, the way we do for the old, the other food drives and the diaper, the diaper drive, line up here in the back, drive through here around 1030 and go through the safe haven parking the, or the overpass that we, the way we normally do it. And then just drive up there and speak to the, uh, those who are going to be out there working, tell them how much food you need and, um, and then we'll be able to get it to you first. So we have about 30 minutes head start if you will, before we open it up to the actual public for the church family. And so if you were able to just drive through, grab uh, the food for you and your family and then drive on, exit out here. Then around 11 o'clock sharp, we are going to open it up for the rest of the public. Amen? Okay? So we're trying to give you the opportunity first if we could. We want to be a blessing to the household of faith. So with that being said, um, be prepared for that. Come out this Saturday at 10 o'clock or 1030 if you need food. Now, the other thing just um, I wanted to share concerning that is the serving opportunity. Uh, we were doing a lot of things. We, and this place was totally not set up for this this evening. I mean, you know, we've been kind of just focusing on outside, and this place has been kind of a borderline wreck and, and all that we're doing. But we just got to it, got everything in order. And I think it was our sister Jenny that said, I think, what is it? Um, what did she say again? Something like many hands make light work, something like that. You know the saying, right? And so it really was a blessing. We were able to get everything done like in eight minutes flat, get this whole place in order, move all the food back there, get everything like literally like eight, nine minutes. We just knocked this thing out. And so I believe in the same way, I believe that will still apply for the food. So if you want to serve, we need as much serving and helpers as much as possible. So if you want to serve on that day, please come out. I think we're saying arrive by 7 o'clock a.m. to 7 and 8 a.m. We're going to have seven, everything set up. We're going to work uh, an assembly line, if you will. And then we're going to be able to hand out the food. So when you come here, you can see our brother Joey Kitutu, our sister um, uh, Mona. McManus, I think Phil Letty's going to be here. Certain people are going to be here already setting things up ahead of time. Just come and if you want to help and they'll give you the job, they'll distribute and show you what the mission is going to be for you, okay? So 7 o'clock, showtime here, and then get ready to just serve and help. So if you are able to do that and you want to take part in serving, this is a wonderful way you can take part in being a blessing to the community. Amen? So if you need food, come out 1030. If you are able to serve or if you can do it both, come out and take part in serving. Grab food for your family as well and then get ready to bless the community in Jesus' name. Amen? All right, just wanted to share that, and I pray everyone's got that. Um, feel free to call in, write in, if you have any other questions concerning that. All right, let's do it. Let's take our Bibles and let's turn to the book of Romans chapter 5. And can I ask just one, um, who's, can somebody just grab me a water, please? I'm about to, um... I think, uh, yeah, thanks, but all the hustling before we um, got here just got real... chapter 5. Today we're actually going to finish this series that we've been on for a few weeks now. Thank you so much, my brother. Everybody, Jeff Barone, my brother in Christ. Love this man. <laughs> Alright. Romans chapter 5 is where we're at today. We're going to finish this passage and this series that we've been on for a few weeks. So this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church, that Gentile church in Rome. 
laying down amazing doctrine and truth and theology is mind blowing when you read all the things that are in here in this in this letter, amazing letter, very crucial letter actually to the church. But specifically we're in chapter 5 and verses 1 through 5 and we're looking at certain things that we've been on, especially in this season that we've been discussing. And so I want to just go ahead and open this uh, by reading this passage as we all often do and then open it up in prayer. Romans chapter 5, New Testament, verses 1 through 5. And the Apostle Paul writes, And having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also... We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, so not only do we have those things that we just read through, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. And now hope does not disappoint. This kind of hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Father, we do want to thank you so much for the privilege we have to gather together in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we do thank you that through him we have access to be able to come boldly before your throne. That we have access and a wonderful privilege, sonship, to be adopted into the kingdom of God, the family of God. And now be here in fellowship. And so we want to thank you because your word reminds us in the book of Revelation that you are there in the midst of the church. So thank you, Lord, that we can believe and trust and count that your presence is here with us. And so we ask that you would minister to us. Draw us deep onto yourself despite all the hustling and having to be able to come together quickly to be in here. We just pray now that we would settle and calm our minds and calm our thoughts, Lord. And just lean in and trust in you, Lord, and what you have to say to us tonight. So we just pray that through your word, you will minister to the heart. May the church this evening have ears to hear what your Holy Spirit is saying to the church. And then I ask for myself, Lord, help me to just be settled. And may the words of my own mouth and the meditation of my own heart be pleasing and acceptable to you in your sight, my Lord, my rock, my redeemer. We thank you. We trust you now. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Hey, do you guys have a, is it, it's going to be our RVS if I turn off this bright light up here? Yeah, it's kind of like, I look at it too, I'm like, who turned that on? Yes, a little bit. Yes? Okay? Hey. All right, amen. All right. Oh, sorry. Here we are. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. And we're again at the end of this passage, and we're at the end of this series that we've entitled. He's there even in the dark spaces, in that dark little place, and we've talked about exactly kind of what that means, where, where we're going with that. There's this rock and hard place that we seem to be in right now in this season. I think of the shutdown itself and then also the sickness and the death that's surrounding. So you have this rock on one side it seems like and then a hard place on one side and we are kind of right in the middle. What do we do? What is truth? What is going on? What are the real signs, the data? Are we, you know, you got all these different things running through people's mind and it causes us, or at least I hope it is, it's calling, causing us to get on our knees and pray and seek the Lord. But for many people, it seems like you're in this dark space between the rock and the hard place. And so we've entitled this series, God is There Though. Just be reminded, we're trying to encourage each other really in the faith, being reminded that the Lord is there in the rock. He's even there in the hard place, but he's also there in that middle, right in between, in that space, in that dark space, amen, in between the rock and the hard place. I believe when I read the scriptures, we understand that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere present at all times, through every season, Everywhere, he's, he's there in all places. So that means that in the midst of the current crisis, any situation, any situation we face, the Lord is there. Nothing holds him back. Walls don't hold him back. Darkness doesn't hold him back. Amen. In fact, when he appears, according to what I read in the scriptures, he distinguishes the darkness. Amen. When he comes, the darkness flees. Fear flees. When the Lord, when we are in the presence of the Lord, the, the book of Psalm tells us that in the presence of the Lord, there's pleasures. In the right hand of the Lord, there's pleasures forevermore. And in His, in his presence, there's joy forevermore. There's this peace that we have when we're in the presence of the Lord. And nothing holds Him back. Amen? And so it's good to know that. It's good to be reminded of that, that the Lord is there even in the dark spaces. We need to be reminded that what He supplies to us at the moment of our salvation, when we trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
he continues to actually supply to us all the way through the journey. As the book of Hebrews says, he saves us and to the uttermost, all the way into to, to stand with him face to face. One day the Bible says we will, but we no longer have to live by faith. We can now live by sight as we're looking at Jesus face to face. The Bible says to the uttermost, he will save us. Our salvation, his presence with us is to the uttermost. Amen? And so not just on the day of our salvation, he supplies certain things to us, but all the way through the journey, here and now, in all different seasons and circumstances, we can thrive, we can walk in joy, we can have peace, we can walk in just true victory. It doesn't mean we're not going to be touched by pain and sorrows at times, and we're not going to be filled in certain seasons in our life with some doubt and unbelief. We all go through those struggles, but if we can remind ourselves, have the right perspective that the Lord never left us. He does not leave us. He will not forsake us. And what he has granted us, what he has supplied to us from the beginning, he still offers throughout our entire journey. And so as we've been looking out through the scriptures, we've already seen certain things from this passage that the Lord supplied to us and what he supplies to us here and now. All right, thank you very much, my son. Thank you. <laughs> now, we're definitely not going to be dehydrated. <laughs> Lots of water. All right, so the question is then, what is he supplied to us at salvation when we came to him by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? And what does he continue to supply to us now? And so we've already seen this throughout these past few weeks. The God the Father supplies the pardon of sin, the Bible makes it clear as we read this. We are justified, made right, declared righteous. He supplies the pardon of sin, but then we also saw that he supplies peace with him. No longer war, we can run to him, not from him. Peace with himself through Jesus Christ, the Son. But then we also saw that in all circumstances, all season, he supplies grace in all of our circumstances. That is that dunamis power to be able to overcome, to live the supernatural Christian life. That dunamis power, but it also means that favor and provision and blessing upon our life. Amen? So God supplies this to us at the moment of salvation but all the way through as well that favor and power to be able to live out the Christian life but then we also saw and I believe we saw this uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago that he supplies the joyful hope of glory because of God's glory and we belonging to him the Bible says one day we will be partakers of his glory so we can rejoice and even the Bible says boast not in an arrogant way but literally not be ashamed and boast and rejoice in the glory of God because he is glorious, he, his, his glory affects us here and now, and one day the Bible says we shall see Christ and be like him. We're not going to be gods, don't get that twisted and wrong, this is not Mormonism, okay? But we are going to be glorified just as he is glorified, new glorified bodies in perfection, no more sickness, no more pain, no more sorrow, amen? We're going to be partakers of his glory. It's amazing when you read all that, read throughout the scriptures and understand this glory. It's mind-blowing and amazing. I don't believe you can even cover it in one teaching. But he supplies that joyful hope of glory. And then about two weeks ago, we took a break last week, but about two weeks ago, we saw that he supplies purpose and perspective in life's pain. Purpose and perspective in life's pain. Just for the record, out of all the different teachings, and I guess I'm just I'm addressing this only because you know it's good to acknowledge this that we're all in the same boat in some way, shape, or form. You know, out of all these messages, all of them people wrote and said, "Hey, that was such a blessing." I got to talk to piece of people um, personally uh, regarding like the message and how it ministered and spoke to them. But this message specifically, the fact that God supplies purpose and perspective in life's pain. This probably ministered to more people um, in this season right now than in all of the other messages, man. People have been writing into us, calling and talking and just coming and having conversations and weeping. That it ministered to them right on the spot because we all can agree that right now in this season of our life, this island, our family, all the things that we see, all the news of death and all these things that we see going around, it begins to really take a toll on our spirit, our thoughts, our soul, our heart, our mind, everything about us. And many of us are just worried and afraid or we have all these different things or we're losing jobs and you know, all these the secondary issues, if you will, being caused by the shutdown. Uh, be it suicide, be it, um, you know what I mean, um, uh, relapse and depressions, all these things. It's touching a lot of families at the core. And this ministered to people knowing that, listen, as a believer in Christ, look, if you're not a believer in Christ and you don't want God's grace, if you're not a believer in Christ, I'm just going to be real about this, and you can care less about God, what he offers and what he's calling out to you for, what he, his, you know, wonderful hand to you. If you don't care about all of that, then okay, but you just need to know this, then on your own strength and on your own power and all that you have to offer, you're going to deal with it on your own. 
and many people have been dealing with it and many people are struggling and that's and this is where people begin to take their lives and go downhill because they don't have that hope but in a, but a, for a believer in Jesus Christ it is not the same it is not the same know that understand that man and be honestly bold about that because it makes me then want to tell as many people as I possibly can about the Lord Jesus Christ because he offers something amazing even in the midst of our pain and struggle, he actually gives us purpose. The Bible makes it clear that he uses it and there's a purpose. And if we have the right spirit and the way we receive it, the right perspective, it all of a sudden turn out to be an occasion for something amazing in our life. An unbeliever, it just becomes darker and darker and darker. But for a believer, if you trust in Jesus Christ right now today, truly trust in him, and you really believe all that we see in the scriptures and all that he's told us, amen, then it becomes an opportunity for growth in our life with the right perspective, we have purpose in it. And so for the Christian, there's a new reality for us, and we need to learn to walk in these new realities. Amen? We got it at the moment of salvation, but it didn't just end there the next day. Now we walk in this new reality. Remember that, Christian. Remember that, brother. Amen? Remember that. In the dark places and the dark spaces, remember that. Now God, if there's trials and testings in your life, there's purpose. If you have the right perspective for these pains, and God will use it in a mighty way. And so today, finally, we're going to look at this last part of this series. And if you're a note taker, here it is. God supplies the greatest form of love. He, he showed us this in the very beginning. But even right now today, amen, it's kind of like a love relationship or with your husband and wife in that relationship. How precious that was in the beginning when you realized just how much you loved one another when you went to the altar, when you made that covenant. And you remember those days? And don't forget those days, amen, because it's so key in our relationship. Don't stop dating. Don't stop. This is a reminder for me as well. My wife is watching this right now, so, you know, making myself accountable before the people. But we can't stop doing these things. We can't forget the amazing love we have. And many times it's that love right there that, for the record, love is a choice. Love is a commitment. Love indeed does take work, but it's glorious and it's beautiful if you have the right perspective. But that love that we have from the very beginning, we're supposed to carry that all the way through and through and through. And the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tells us what true love looks like when it's in display and it's action. Amen? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not hold a wrong doing. All these different things that you see in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In the beginning, when we understood the gospel of Jesus Christ, we understood God's love for that moment. We didn't understand everything about everything, but we understood that much, amen, that we were sinners, could not save ourselves, but the love and mercy and grace of God came. Jesus Christ himself came, stepped foot on this earth, died on the cross for our sin. The gospel, the good news, took my penalty, took your penalty, amen, upon the cross at Calvary, was buried, but rose again on the third day. We understood that. If you're a believer in Christ, then we at least understood that much, that I am I'm lost without him, but now I'm able to have life and freedom and forgiveness of sin through him. I understood that love that God had for me even when I was wretched toward him. I remember that from the very beginning. But it's that same love the Bible says that God supplies in every season of our life. If we would just get our eyes on him, don't move from him. So church, this is something we experienced and understood when we believe the gospel. But this is also something, again, we need to be reminded of, especially in the dark spaces and the dark places of our lives. Amen? Now, in chapter 2, or verse 2, we already, we saw that we can rejoice because we have such glorious future to look forward to. So we can rejoice in that. Then in verse 3 and 4, Paul says, but not only that, we can also rejoice here and now uh, in the glory and glory in the trials and in the hardships right here, right now in all seasons. Amen. So by God's grace, having the right perspective, that means, again, receiving the trials and troubles with the right spirit and attitude, right, and understanding these trials then, he says, will become an opportunity to grow in perseverance and in endurance. This in turn will produce a tested and proven character, which in turn, so with this, there's like this great golden chain, if you will. So the trials come, but it gives us the opportunity to grow in perseverance and endurance. And in that, when we pass through that, it does something in us. It produces a tested, proven character in our life, which in turn strengthens, Paul says here, our hope. And that hope is that confident assurance, that confident expectation, right, of eternal. Because all that God says and all that he promised us, our salvation in full. We're receiving, we, we, we're tasting, we, have, we can taste of salvation here and now. But the Bible makes it clear that, man, we are being saved through and through. And one day in full we shall, you know, 
really inherit or experience the fullness of the salvation that we read about in the scriptures that we have in Christ. One day, this is not the end of it. Amen? We're not even close to all that God really has for us in Jesus Christ. And so the Bible says through all these things, it produces something in us and it, it, it gives us this confident assurance more and more and more and more as we mature in faith of the promises, again, salvation, our glorification, an eternal state, our place in his kingdom. All these things, God has a purpose for it. So maybe if you will, let me just give you, I'll give you, for those who actually came out on, um, and you're praying through um, our, um, what was it that we just had Friday? Uh, before the throne, amen? So before the throne, we already pressed this upon our, I'm gonna give you a, like, a real time example, if you will, a real life example. If you can't think of one, the way the Lord used the trials to do these things in you. To me, before the throne, our time, what we had to deal with leading up to it, is almost exact, it's almost, uh, to me, it's just, for me, it's what the scripture is talking about in a sense, one small form of it. We had already, once we knew that, hey, you know, the churches were going to open up a little bit more, and we've been praying for a couple of months now, or at least about maybe two months, we've been talking about doing our before the throne, but then when the shutdown came, we decided to push it back. So we prayed and prayed and prayed about it, and we, we sensed clearly that the Lord showed us, go ahead, you know, it's a go in that sense in our heart to go ahead and do it. So last Friday, we decided to do before the throne. Rain or shine was our thought, and every praise the Lord that everyone in the worship team was in agreement. They got together and did their best to just pull together and, 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 you know what I'm saying, be faithful to take part in before the throne. But here's the deal. So we already knew that this is what the Lord wanted us to do. We wanted to be faithful in doing it. We woke up that morning and we said, Ray Michelle, we're going to do it. And many of you, if you guys remember waking up, I'm going to assume you woke up on Friday. Man, and I'm going to assume that you felt, at least you experienced some of the rain. I think it was mostly in the north. I don't know if it was in the south, but that was in the northern part. But it was raining and pouring and thundering like crazy. Yes? Was that your testimony? Do you remember it? Yeah. And I'm telling you why, our phone started blowing up. Hey, are we still doing before the throne? Are we still doing before the throne? Are we still going to do it outside? And I totally get it because I started to think, yeah, are we still really going to do it? We felt the Lord tell us to do it. And it's like, it was a go. Everyone's in agreement. We've all been praying up. And then all of a sudden, Friday morning, wake up and bang, here we are with not just rain, like rain, 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 and thundering, and lightning. And it's like, right, everybody's asking me, hey, are we really going to do these things? So here's something to just think about, you know? Trials and testing. We knew the Lord wanted us to do this. All of a sudden, we're hit, we're faced with this trial. And with a little testing of our faith, all the rain and the thundering, nonstop thundering, happened Friday morning. Yes? But then, as we've been saying in the scripture, this is what Paul's talking about. But that thing right there gives us an opportunity. It brings forth an occasion and an opportunity to grow in our faith and perseverance and this testing. So what did we all started doing? Amen? At least, uh, I'm assuming most of us at least did. We got on our knees and we started praying and we started seeking the Lord. We put it out on the men and the women. Shout, hey, everyone, keep on praying concerning the weather. We want to be faithful. Just keep on taking this to the Lord. We knew in our heart we're going to show up here, but we're just asking the Lord, Lord, just have grace and mercy upon your people as we just want to bring our worship to you. Amen? And we all began just praying and praying and praying. I remember specifically... My wife, Jen, and I, and it was raining, and we were just looking out the window, and so we were in our room, and we decided, let's just pray, and so I just started praying, 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 and trusting the Lord, and it was just a sweet time of prayer, Then my wife started praying, and she just stormed the gates as well, and literally, before she said amen, I kid you not, I'm not going to say he stopped it on the account of us, maybe he did, maybe he did, but maybe we were all praying together, before she even said amen, I kid you not, and the Lord, I'll have to answer to him if I'm lying, you know what I'm saying, because one day I'll stand before him. The rain literally stopped. Like it was, wow. Done. It was the craziest thing. And we just looked at each other, but we didn't stop. We just now kept thanking him, thanking him, thanking him. But we knew, all right, it was still early in the morning. We still had the afternoon to deal with. And then we started the evening, and it was still raining down in some places from what I understand. But we just trusted the Lord. So all I'm trying to say is this. That trial, that little testing, when we wanted to do the Lord's will, brought about that opportunity to get on our knees and to... He gave us the position, the opportunity to either back out, back away, not have faith for that moment, or persevere and, and trust in Him. And that's what we did, because then we all showed up. Amen? We put feet to our faith, and we showed up. We got the canopy ready, we got the lights ready, and we were just looking at the clouds, and it began to just clear up, and we knew it, and we knew it. Just, I think most of us sense like, man, the Lord is so in this, you know what I mean? It was an amazing blessing. And so what happened was we went through that, we came here into this place, and then we began to worship our Lord. And what it did, if you, if you didn't already notice, if you didn't see it, it really increased our confidence, our hope in Him. Amen? It didn't make us bitter. It didn't draw us back. It actually made us come out here and worship that much more. So we worship God wholeheartedly when we got out here to this place. We were singing about His goodness, His power, His majesty. We practiced in faith what 
with what we just had here in this spot, what we know is to come. One day, every believer in Christ, past, present, and futures, the Jews, the Gentiles, the, the 144,000 Jews, those who have actually come out in the tribulation period, all the believers in all history will be worshiping before the throne of God. And we got to practice that in faith here and now with what little things we have. And it was glorious. Amen? It was amazing. There was the Spirit of God indeed pour out in a wonderful way. And what, if you just look at what's going on, we wanted to do the Lord's will. Testing came. It gave us the opportunity to, to trust in the Lord and grow in that perseverance. When we came here, we were able to worship the Lord. And out of that, we have this proven, it brought about this proven character. And from this proven character, none of us were saying, Lord, we don't believe you're faithful. Instead, we're all saying, Lord, we believe that much more how faithful you are. Amen. It made us so much more confident on, in what God said he would do. Amen. That's what Paul's talking about. Are these things, there's this beautiful chain reaction when we have the right perspective, when we trust the Lord. So when we receive trial with the right perspective and the spirit, it ultimately strengthens our hope, not weakens it. Amen? So praise the Lord for the trials that come. But now, here's where it gets kind of interesting. Because now we see, it's almost like the Apostle Paul throws this kind of this little twist to it. So you'll you miss it if you're not careful, okay? Now this is where he says then in verse 5. And here's our passage, our, our verse for the day, our passage for the day. He says then in verse 5, now hope. So having done all that, going through that chain reaction, if you will, of growing in hope. Now hope, this confident assurance, does not disappoint. What does he mean by that? In other words, church, this confident assurance we have of our salvation, our future glory, will not put us to shame. It will not be a letdown or fall short of its fulfillment. Amen? What he said he will do, he will do, and we will not be. We are not ashamed of it. We will not be ashamed by it. It will not let us down. It will not be a dud. It will not be like false advertisement or a failed assurance. This hope that we have will not be like that at all. We will never be ashamed by this hope that you and I have as we're looking forward for this glorious moment when we see the Lord and we receive in full all that he's saying that we're going to receive. This hope will not put us to shame. We will never let us down. Okay? Now, here's where it gets interesting. If you, again, if, you, if you're not careful and you don't read this right, you can miss the point of what the Apostle Paul is basically trying to say to us here. Our like, basis, okay, is for not being ashamed, is not like found in the trials itself. It's not found in like even in our growing, in our growing in faith, kind of like we're talking about that chain reaction that happens when the trials come, it gives you an opportunity to persevere, and then when you persevere, it, it gives you a proven, tested character, and from there it builds that confidence. All those things are wonderful, but if you really understand it, it's just a part of our growth. It strengthens our walk, it grows our walk, but that is not the reason why you and I do not have to be ashamed or that's not the reason why the Bible says this hope that we have will not put us to shame. It will not be a letdown and it will not be a failure. That's not why we will not be ashamed. In other words, all those things help us again to strengthen our walk. But the reason why we came to worship, now just think about this for a moment, using that same situation, the very reason why you and I came to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. We weren't looking for the trouble. We weren't looking for the testing. We weren't, we weren't looking to see if we can, you know, maneuver around the rain. And today, let's see if we can grow enough. And we really weren't looking for that. That's not what was in our heart. The reason why you and I came out to worship on that day and the why we went through all the things that we go through or why you go through the trials, you know what I'm saying, period. is because we have all tasted and seen and experienced the love of Christ. It's because we love him, we belong to him, we know this, and we are willing to come out and worship and go through all those things. Amen? All of those things were part of our journey and out of the growth. But at the end of the day, the reason why the hope we have will not put us to shame is because of the love of God. What he has already given us and what he has already demonstrated. And that's what Paul is really saying here. Verse 5, he says, this hope that we have will not put us to shame. It will not let us down. That's what that word means. Or fall short of its fulfillment. We can be assured of this. But he says, not because of anything else, but because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Amen? That's why we can bank that the hope we have 
will never put us to shame. We will not, we, we don't be ashamed of it, and we will not be ashamed by it. He will fulfill it, but not because of anything else, only because the only reason why we can trust this is because of the love of God that has already been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. In other, re in other words, the reason you and I can be assured that we will not be ashamed of this hope and that we will receive all that God said we would is because upon faith in Jesus Christ, we have been given the Holy Spirit of God, the Bible says, which seals us to the day of redemption and which floods, who floods our heart with this love. Amen? Just think about this for a moment. You remember again, just think about that day when you first came to know the Lord. You know, all of us here, have, have our if you're a believer in Christ, we all have our testimony. Maybe we don't always feel it. Sometimes we feel a little bit distant here and there. But remember that day when you understood the gospel and you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's kind of like what we talked about in the beginning of your relationship with husband and wife. Whatever the case may be, the point I'm trying to say is there is this love that you experience. Amen. God already demonstrated his great love for us. The Bible makes it clear in the beginning. He already showed us all these things. He's already showed us the greatest demonstration of faithfulness and love. You remember the day that when you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, you remember that love. So remember that. God already demonstrated the greatest love toward us, and that is that of God pay love. Love in action, sacrificial love, selfless love, undeservingly yet freely given love. That kind of love is what God already showed us from the get-go. And because of that love, we can have this hope and, and be assured that we will not be ashamed. So as we've been reading this passage, we have been looking at verses 6 through 10, but I'm just going to read it because they're actually connected and they strengthen this understanding of, of God giving us the greatest kind of love. And this is why we know we don't have to be ashamed or we will never be ashamed. So this is what it reads in verse 6. Or This is, again, not a part of the verses that we've been looking at, but this is all together. It's all connected. Look at what it says in verse 6 if you read down there. And, and for when we were still without strength, that means literally we were powerless to help ourselves out of the consequences of sin. When we were still without sin or, or strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Amen? So in other words, he died for all of us. Who's the ungodly? Every single one of us. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So when we were incapable of saving ourselves, doing anything about it, in due season, Christ came, died. The Bible says Christ died for the ungodly. But then it says in verse 7, for scarcely, and I was even strengthening this understanding of exactly what kind of sacrifice Jesus made for us, church. Verse 7 says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. You know what that means? It means even for a good person, you will find it very, very, very rare that another person would actually step out and literally die in the place for that good person if they have the opportunity to that's just the reality of it. That's the way the flesh operates. Even good people looking at another good person. I'm not saying I'm good. You know what I'm saying? But good people looking at another good person. If they saw that they were about to die. We can do righteous things. But that's like, you know what I mean? The greatest kind of like sacrifice you can actually give your life for another. But it's still very rare that even someone would find a good person and know that he's about to die. And literally take his place. And no, you live. Or let me... Take, you know what I'm saying? Do what, let me take your place in this thing and literally die. Give my life so that you can live. It has happened before in history. There's no doubt about it. But the point that Paul is trying to make is in reality, even that is extremely rare to find someone who would die from even a good person. That's a rare, rare thing. That's what Paul is saying very scarcely. However, this is then what we see the Bible says that Christ did for us. Verse 8 says, but God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners. Amen? We weren't even good. We were not righteous. We weren't chasing after him. We weren't, you know what I mean? Many of us, if we're honest, we're making a wreck out of our life, blaspheming, dishonoring God. We may not have known it, or maybe we did, but we were living that life before we finally surrendered to Jesus Christ. We weren't, we were sinners who fall short of God's amazing standard and glory. And the Bible says God's kind of love was this. And while we were still sinners, Christ came willingly. In other words, it wasn't against his will. He willingly, in agreement, came and died on the cross for our sin. 
That is the greatest form of love, church, agape love, sacrificial, freely given, yet we did not deserve it kind of love. It's truly a love that is truly, I believe, out of this world. The world's love is totally different. This is an out of this world kind of love. Very scarcely for a good person, one would die. But for a sinner, for someone who's your total enemy and who's at war with you and who's, you know what I mean? That you would actually die for that person and let them go free. That's crazy. That's unheard of. That's God. That's Jesus Christ. That's the kind of love he has already displayed to every one of us. What an amazing and again out of this world kind of love that God has demonstrated for us. Amen? And so Paul's point, when you read, it, you read now verse 9 and 10, and we'll wind down with this. Paul then says in verse 9 and 10, so this is the point he's trying to make with this. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through death of his son, much more having been reconciled, then we shall be saved by his life. So in other words, if you and I being sinful, being wretched, being lost, were shown like this amazing love, this amazing grace, you know what I mean, of God. We were shown the love of God by Jesus willingly dying on the cross for our, taking our place. And then, as we read here, we escape the wrath of God to come by placing our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, believing in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. If all of this happened, even while we were still sinners, how much more now that we who are in Christ will receive the ultimate fulfillment of our salvation and all that God has promised. You see what Paul is trying to say? This is why we know that, man, the hope we have is not, we don't have to be ashamed about it and we will not be put to shame. If the Lord did all of this even while we were sinners, now in Christ, how much more is he going to fulfill and bless, amen? Keep his promise and save again to the uttermost. So the hope that we have in Christ will be fulfilled. This is what the Bible is telling us. We can be assured that we will not be put to shame because God already demonstrated his great love for us. Amen? He has already demonstrated his great love for us. And so here's the thing. In fact, I want to give you an exhortation because then this is what the Bible then tells us. I find it interesting that when you begin to read the scriptures, having come to the love of God, believing in the gospel, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him will not perish, you will not go into condemnation, but you will have everlasting life. Who, right? And this is how much God loved us. When you read the scriptures and you enter into that love, you know what the Bible's exhortation is? To continue then, to grow in that love and grow in that understanding. Much of the scriptures, when you read it, is actually exhorting, is exhorting the church to like really understand that love, grow and understand, like spend some time with the Lord so that you can know his amazing love for you. That's like the wonderful mission of the church for us you and I as believers in Christ know that love this is what Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14 through 21 says this is the earnest prayer of the Apostle Paul for the church in Ephesus but for the church in general this is what he says for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the might through his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through, uh, through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, church. This is what he says, that as you grow, this is Paul's prayer, that man, you will be strengthened by the Holy Spirit, that inner man of you will be strengthened by faith, that you will be rooted and grounded in his love, and you may be able to comprehend with all the saints, all of us together, what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Then he says, And now to him who was able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. You see what Paul is saying? His, he bowed his knees, his great earnest prayers that the church would know the depth, width, height, and length of God's amazing love and be rooted and grounded in it. Don't drift from it. Don't forget it. Amen. Then he says in Romans 8.35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or sword or COVID-19 or the shutdown? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Amen. The answer is no one, nothing. Then down in verse in chapter 8, verse 37 to 39, he says, Yet 
In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, Paul says, that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Keep on growing and learning about God's love for you because this is this is the exhortation to the church. Now you've entered into this love. Now keep on knowing it more deeply. Keep on growing. But then look at what he says lastly in, in, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 through 19. As you and I grow in maturity and love, as we press in and we spend time with the Lord and we know his great love for us, look at what the Bible says it actually does. There is no fear in love. But perfect love, that means mature and complete love, cast out all fear. Because fear, this kind of fear, not reverence, that's not what it's talking about. It's that dread, that thing where you don't want to see God because you know you're not worthy. There's this fear that creeps in. You know you're a sinner. You know all these things. You've done wretched things. And for that, you know you probably don't want to see God face to face. But when you understand God's love for you, when you believe in the gospel, you understand his love for you, and then you begin to walk with him and just journey with him, do life with him, you begin to know his great love. You want to know what the Bible says? Slowly but surely, when that love becomes more and more mature and complete, the fear begins to be cast away. Perfect, complete, mature love cast away all fear because that fear involves torment, it says. But he who fears has not been made perfect, mature, complete in love. We love him because he first loved us. Amen. That's what the Bible says, man. So here's the deal. Are you walking in fear right now today? And even, and even better yet, are you dreading the, the fact that one day you're going to stand before God? Is that a thought in your heart and in your mind? So I'll tell you this. If that's you right now, there's one of two things that's going on. Either one, you don't belong to him. You don't understand this love because you haven't received the gospel of Jesus Christ. And toward the end of this message, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that. But maybe you understand that your sin has not been washed clean. You don't have this freedom, this forgiveness of sin, this peace with Him. And so you don't understand. You've never experienced the love of God for you. Maybe that's the situation. But if you're here and you have believed in the Lord and you trust Him and you, you've known that love in the beginning, it just simply means... That you're not growing in maturity in his love. There's a lie maybe. There's things keeping you away. There's all these different things that's making you fearful to meet him face to face. The Bible says we don't have to do that. The more you understand his great love for us, that perfect love casts out all fear. It casts out the fear we got to deal with now. But ultimately what this is talking about is that it casts out the fear of judgment. It casts out that fear of dread and torment because you know that he loves you and we only love him because he first loved us. Amen. And we look forward to meeting him. We look forward to standing before him and seeing the one we love and love us face to face. Amen. Amen. So when you're mature in your love, that's, that's, that's what's going to happen. But if you don't know him that closely yet, if you're not just close to him in that sense, keep on growing. Because the more you know him, the more you begin to love him. The more you know his great love, perfect love, cast out all fear. Amen? So this is what Paul is telling us here in the book of Romans. We don't have to be ashamed and the hope we have will never put us to shame. Because God has already demonstrated his great love for us. We can bank on this. We don't have to worry about anything else. The fact that he already died for us, called us into to relationship with him, is his demonstration of his faithfulness and his love. The more we go to know him and understand his great love for us, the less fearful we have of judgment, torment, seeing him face to face. We actually become more and more excited and even anxious in a sense to see our great God and Savior. Amen. So again, we can be assured that we will not be put to shame according to what Paul says here because God has already demonstrated his great love for us. So in the dark places, in the dark spaces, in the dark seasons, in all of the things that we are facing between that rock and in the hard place, if you think you are alone, if you think you are abandoned, if you think that you are not loved or nobody loves you, all you have to do, according to the Bible, is go back and look at the cross. Amen? Look at what Jesus Christ demonstrated it, that he loves you. Amen? That's all you really have to do. If everyone else abandons you, all you have to do is go back to the foot of the cross at Calvary and remember what Jesus Christ did for you. He died. He demonstrated it all. And I love you. And he died to take your place, my place. Amen? So that we can be made right with the Father and dwell with them for all eternity. Amen? 
So you don't ever have to go thinking you're unloved. Even if everyone else abandons, go to Christ. He already demonstrated it. Remember that God is even there in the dark spaces and in the dark places. And he supplies the pardon of sin, church. He supplies peace with himself. He supplies grace in all of our circumstances. He supplies the joyful hope of glory. He supplies purpose and perspective in all of life's pain. All of it. All of life's pain. For a believer, he will give you, he will show you purpose. If you have the right perspective, there's a purpose behind it. And lastly, he supplies the greatest form of love in the moment of our salvation, but all the way through so that we can know, amen, that we will not be put to shame when we see him face to face one day. Amen. Know God's love, perfect love, cast out all fear. Father, we do want to thank you for your amazing grace, and we thank you for your love. We thank you, Lord, that in all that we see and all that we go through in life, we can be assured that we have a future and a hope with you. But we can be sure that we have a future and a hope with you that affects us even the way we live right now. Not because of any merit of ourselves, not because of anything, anything we have to offer, anything we bring to the table, nothing that anyone else in the world, be it our, our families, our government, Lord, even one another that we supply to each other. We only have this assurance because of the love of Christ that dwells in us, that has already been demonstrated to us at the cross, Lord. You have already demonstrated how much you love us, that you took our place. The debt that we owe, that sin that we, Lord, committed, you took it upon the cross at Calvary. And now having trusted in you as our Lord and our Savior, the Bible says you have washed away our sin. You have given us eternal life and a hope that will never be taken away and a hope that will never put us to shame. You loved us first, Lord, and so we love you. We just want to thank you for that, God. And we pray in the midst of this season, Lord, that you continue to encourage the, the brethren, the saints, but then, Lord, also those maybe who do not know you and are not walking with you. We pray that, Lord, they would come to trust in you as their Lord and as their Savior, put their faith in Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we pray today, Lord, if there's someone being listening on, 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 on the live stream or maybe here this evening, in this room, if someone has not trusted you as their Lord and Savior, we pray today will be the day that they were born again of the Spirit of God, that they were made right with you, and their sins are forgiven. We love you, Lord. We commit this to you here and now, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, the Bible says in Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made on to salvation. So right now we're going to take a moment and we're going to sing and we're going to worship the Lord. But if God is speaking to anyone here, if the Lord is speaking to you and you know for sure you have not trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then today the Bible says, believe in your heart, confess in your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you shall be saved. And so today, as an expression tonight of your faith, if the Lord is ministering to anyone here, and you know the Lord perhaps is drawing you to himself, we're going to worship, we're going to take a moment and worship our Lord and our Savior, but the Lord is speaking to you specifically, then I'm going to call you to come out of your seat. I'm going to call you publicly because Jesus Christ died on the cross publicly. Amen? So I'm going to call you here and now as an expression of your faith to come out of your seat and come down to the aisle. And as a brother and as a friend, I'm going to lead you to receive Jesus Christ today as your Lord and as your Savior. Amen? It's an expression of your faith. So if the Lord is speaking, we're going to worship, and we'll give you time to come forward and make that declaration today. If the Lord is speaking, then come now. I heard a broken wind on my way to the sin. Jesus is called.
Amen. Father, we do want to thank you, Lord, for all those here in the house that have trusted in you as Lord and Savior. We pray you continue to minister to them, Lord, strengthen us, grow us in our faith, especially for such a time as this. But Lord, we do acknowledge that perhaps there's just someone there maybe that is watching in the live stream. We don't know your state and your circumstances. Maybe if you're listening to this message right here, right now, and the Lord is ministering to you right where you are at. And perhaps maybe tonight you want to surrender your life to the Lord. So I want to give you that opportunity. We can't see what's, you know, there's no one here this morning, but we can't see what's going on there in the live stream. So for those of you that are there that are listening, if today the Lord has spoke to you, and you know that today you want to surrender your life and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then I want to lead you to pray and receive Jesus Christ as an expression of your faith. Amen. And so wherever you're at, just bow your heart, really bow your head, and repeat after me. And as a brother, I'm going to lead you to receive Christ as Savior today, this evening. Amen? So if you're there and you're watching, and if you're there and this is the prayer of your heart, then repeat after me as we cry out to the Lord. Heavenly Father, I admit that I am a sinner, and I have sinned against you, and I have sinned against others. But I have heard the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for my sin and that he rose again on the third day. And so today, I ask forgiveness of my sin. I repent of my thinking toward you. And today, I place my faith in your son, Jesus Christ, for the salvation of my soul. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you. Thank you for dying on the cross, Lord Jesus, for my sin. I make you Lord of my life. Now help me to walk with you all the days of it. I love you and I thank you. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. And if you're listening to this, amen. Praise the Lord. If you're listening to this and you are one of those people maybe that have received the Lord, you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, and as an expression you pray with me, please write in. Call in to us or write in to Calvary and just let us know so that we can take part in encouraging you and praying over you. Amen. And just loving on you in the faith. You are not alone. We are with you. Above all, the Lord is with you. But the church family is with you too. Amen. So please let us know how we can minister and how we can pray to you. We love you so much. All right, familiar. We have one last song of worship. Amen. And we can all just rise up and we'll sing our last song of worship. Praise Isn't the Lord. What an amazing service.